Hey, what's going on? Steve Peterson of Infinity Investments. And recently I did a video on 1031 exchange success. And I got a lot of questions about some of the rules about 1031 exchanges. And there's a lot of them. But today I'm gonna talk about the top five rules you need to know when conducting a 1031 tax deferred exchange. Now, number one, before I get into the rules is, you need to be working with qualified experts on this, from your real estate broker, to your mortgage broker, to the uh, qualified intermediary, which is the company that handles the exchange, to the title company. If you have an attorney, an attorney, a tax a CPA who knows about this stuff because it's a complicated transaction. You can do it, it can be done, it can be done efficiently, but you need to have a team of experts working with you. That being said, there's some things that you really need to know when you're conducting this 1031 exchange. Number one, okay, let's talk about engaging the qualified intermediary. In the business, we call it the QI. And you need to engage the QI before the close of escrow. Rule number one, engage the QI before you close. Because what happens is, say you close escrow and they send you or your client the money, you have now what's, you are now what's called in construction constructive receipt of the funds. Meaning that you can't exchange. You are paying capital gains taxes. State of California, that means you're paying the feds and you're paying the great old golden state. You don't want to do that, especially if you were trying to do the exchange. Seems real simple. Unfortunately, people have bumped their heads up against the wall in the wrong way in this one. So what you want to do is you want to engage the QI before close, at least a day before close. Now, I highly recommend that you do this as soon as you open up escrow, on the down leg property, the property that you're selling, go ahead and engage the qualified intermediary because you don't want any surprises. They've got a set of exchange documents that they need the seller to sign. Let's minimize our chaos at the end of a closing. As you know, real estate brokers, agents, investors, principals, you know at the end of a closing, it can get tedious and, and crazy. So let's minimize on that by engaging the QI up front. That way, if there's anything that, that you need to ask or you need to address during the escrow, you're not waiting at the end and getting some, uh, you know, you know, getting some information and having to scramble. This is not a scramble drill. Unfortunately, it ends up being like that a lot of times, but we want to take our diligent steps towards making sure that this transaction goes as smooth as possible. So you want to engage the QI before the close of escrow. Okay, and this the, the qualified intermediary is a is very much like an escrow company, if you will, for the exchange. They're a neutral third party who's going to receive the money from the escrow when the property's sold. Makes you know follow all the rules, make sure you're in compliance, and then they're going to disperse the money when you go buy your replacement property. Okay, very very important that you choose the right QI. Okay, I work a lot with IPX 1031 Exchange. I've also worked with Chicago Deferred Exchange. Um, there's a lot of different companies, a Rexco exchange, but you want to make sure that this company is properly licensed and bonded and funded because back in the Great Recession, there were a lot of companies popping up, this lawyer, mom and pop fund uh, companies uh, doing stuff, and they would you know get the money, and unfortunately, a couple of them got the money and they ran off, and then their clients were stuck on the hook without any money and then on taxes. You got to make sure you're dealing with a reputable firm, one that's licensed, bonded, and they're you know they're well capitalized, and you don't have to worry about them going bankrupt either. Very important. So engage the QI, the right QI, before the close of escrow. That's number one. Number two, okay, the identification and closing deadline requirements. This is the most stressful piece, I believe, in my opinion of the business, of the exchange process, okay? Because from the date escrow closes, you got 45 calendar days, not 45 business days. It's another big mistake. And I just had someone call me yesterday, hey, we got 60 days, right? No, you don't got 60 days, you got 45 days. And that includes Christmas, Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, 4th of July, all of that. Now, I will say, during COVID, there was an extension made. 
And I, I, I made a video with Ron Ricard of IPX 1031 because when COVID first hit and on April, there was an extension of the 45 days and you know to, to identify your property. Okay, but let's just pretend like that because right now that extension is not in action. We're back to the 45 days to identify. And what identify means is that you have to fill out the exchange documents identifying the address and the purchase price of the property that you're gonna be acquiring, okay? So you got 45 days from the close of escrow to go ahead and do that. And then you have 180 days, important, from the close of escrow to club of your down leg property, the property you sold. So close of escrow to down leg property, 180 days later, you have to have closed the replacement property. Okay, that's not 180 days at the end of 45 days. That 45 day identification period is within the 180 days. A lot of people get this one wrong because it's not 45 plus 180. It's 45 within the 180. And again, that 180, calendar days, not business days. Okay, and holidays don't count. All right, now, let me just talk a little bit about the identification process because there's a couple of different ways you can identify. The most common way to identify, what we recommend, is the three property rule. So you, you have to identify up to three properties, you write them on a piece of paper, submit them to the qualified intermediary. However, there's another rule that, that's a little bit more complicated called the 200% rule, which means this, you can identify 100 properties if you want, an unlimited amount of properties, so long as the total aggregate value of all those properties that you identify does not exceed 200%, 200% of the value of the down leg property. So in other words, you sell a property for a million dollars, right? You can identify however many properties you wanna uh, identify, as long as the aggregate value, the total value of all the properties you identify does not exceed $2 million, okay? 200% rule. Very, very important, okay? I, I, I suggest you try to stick with the three property rule because it's a lot more straightforward. And we wanna try to simplify this process as much as we possibly can because there's a lot of moving parts, okay? So that's just some clarity within that. 45 days from the close of escrow to identify, 180 days from the close of escrow to close on the new properties, on the replacement properties, okay? Calendar days, not business days, holidays don't count. Got it? All right. Rule number three. All right. Now, this is very, very important because you need to be able to spend the cash and replace the debt. Okay. Here's what I mean by that. So let's say you sold a property at a million dollars. All right. You, and let's just say the property that you sold had a $600,000 loan against it. So you sold that a million dollars and you've got 400,000. That's probably gonna be a blend of your gain and your original investment. And by the way, just so you know, not to get into tax stuff, but when you pay capital gains, it's based on the gain, okay? What you profited, okay? Not necessarily your initial investment. So your initial investment goes on what's called your basis. And when you're taxed, you're taxed on the gain, all right? However, when you're exchanging, you need to invest all of that cash into the next one and into the, what's called the replacement property. Any cash that you do not invest, even if you if it was a part of the original investment, is what's called boot. And boot is the amount of money that you need to pay taxes on. Now, some of you guys say, hey, I wanna do this exchange, I wanna reinvest, I wanna buy another property, but I need to put like 50 grand in my pocket just because you know I need to put some money in my pocket, right? You can do that, but just understand, if you were to do that, you're gonna pay taxes on that amount because it's boot, okay? And that might be cool because you might need to put some cash in your pocket, right? But if you're not trying to pay any boot, you need to be aware that you need to spend all of that cash, okay? And here's the next thing is, you need to replace all of that debt. Meaning that if you had $600,000 of debt on your down leg property, you need to at least, at least, have $600,000 of debt on the new upleg property or properties. And that can, again, be, it can be spread out over 
three properties, if you do the three property rule, or however many properties if you do the 200% rule. But when you complete the exchange, you have to at least carry the amount of debt you had in the, in the property, the down leg, the property you sold to the replacement properties. Very, very important. A lot of people think, hey, you know, we're gonna sell this property and just, you know, I don't need debt anymore. I just wanna take my cash and buy something for cash. Well, let's just say you did that and you had a million dollars to 400,000, about 400,000 for cash. You're gonna pay taxes on $600,000 of boot as if you put $600,000 in your pocket. That's even worse, you know? Um, so you have to understand this. Here's the simple way to think about it. Spend the cash, replace the debt. Spend the cash, replace the debt. You ain't got to worry about it. You're good, okay? Now, rule number four. Rule number four. Like kind, you, you have to exchange in what's called a like-kind property. And here's what that means. It has to be deed for deed, right? It doesn't mean if you sell an apartment building that you have to buy an office building. Or I'm sorry, excuse me. It doesn't mean that if you sell an apartment building, you have to buy another apartment building. You can sell your apartment building and buy an office building or, or vacant land or retail building or an industrial property, whatever. It just has to you know, follow the, the other rules that we talked about. But the like kind means deed for deed, okay? It has to be deed for deed. When you sell out of a property, then you have to come back into the other, you know, deed. It can't be an LLC interest, okay? It can't be stocks in a real estate company, okay? It can't be a business. It has to be a deed. You sold the deed, you have to go into a deed, all right? Now, what you can do, what you can do is invest into like a group investment, like a tenant in common or a Delaware statutory trust where there's other investors. But in doing so, You've got to make sure, you know, that the allocations of how much you invest into that property fit within, you know, the numbers of spending the cash and replacing the debt. Okay, a little bit more complicated when you invest coming out of exchange into a group investment. You can do it, but you have to understand that, you know, you, it has to be deed for deed. You can't sell your property and then go into an LLC interest. You have to have a deeded percent of that property, like you would have in a tenants in common or you would have in a Delaware statutory trust. Very, 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 very important on that, okay? Critical, I, I get this question from investors all the time, and there's one coming up and they were selling apartments and like, well, I just wanna, you know, I, I, you know, I, I was thinking about buying this land and doing this stuff, but I, I know I have to stay like kind. And I told him, I said, no, you could actually do that if the numbers make sense, because you don't have to sell apartments and buy another apartment, okay? Very, very important. Now. Rule number five is something I think that you guys need to um, think about and you know uh, figure out if you're into if you're investing into partnerships, okay? And let's say you guys have multiple partners into a deal, and then multiple partners are going to sell, but the partners are not going to stay together, okay? In general, if you have multiple partners and you guys sell, you guys are selling the LLC, you guys all need to then in you know, stay together and buy the other property in the LLC, all things considered, okay? What you're not able to do is sell, everybody go their separate ways and then exchange, okay? You're not able to do that technically. Then now, now, you might be able to structure the LLC before you sell and everything. There's some LLC things you can do to kind of make sure that happens. But from a general standpoint, if you're selling out of a partnership or a group investing, the group needs to stay together to go buy something else in order to conduct an exchange. There's other ways if you're selling out a group and you want to go, you want to split from the group. There's other ways to defer taxes through, you know, qualified opportunity zones, charitable remainder trust, um, you know, possibly DSTs. But if you're trying to sell and everybody goes their separate way and you individually want to go and buy another property in an exchange you're not able to do it. Now, there there are some things you might not talk to your lawyer, talk to your attorney, your accountant, you might be able to do, if you guys are saying, hey, we wanna sell, but we don't wanna you know, stay together, you know, what can we do that, to make sure that one of the partners can do an exchange, okay? But the, the, the general piece of it is if you guys are selling as a partership or a group investing and you, need to, and you wanna do an exchange, you 
have to stay together, okay? And if not, then you really need to pre-plan before you sell and figure out how you're gonna do a deal uh, and, and, and in the context of a 1031 exchange. Now, as I wrap this up, I always like to say, the reason we do an exchange is to buy a better, better asset, not to defer uh, capital gains taxes, okay? You don't wanna just do an exchange to defer the taxes and buy a worse asset. That's a, that's a bad move. You wanna make sure in doing this that you're going from one asset to a better asset or one situation to a better situation. Let the economics drive the deal and let the icing on the cake be the deferral capital gain. I hope this was helpful. Like, subscribe, share this with friends, uh, stay engaged. And I'm gonna do another video on 1031 exchanges because I really see there's a lot of gray zones and I, I, you know, as we navigate, especially out of this pandemic, and a lot of people are doing exchanges, we need to be really clear and succinct on what we're doing, how we're doing it, and who we're doing it with. I look forward to seeing y'all in the next video. Have a great day. The Power Is Now Media is worldwide with growing audience of future home buyers, investors, builders, developers, real estate agents, and brokers. The Power Is Now Media is well positioned to increase awareness and produce results for our growing roster of advertising partners. An advertisement on any of our platforms is the right step toward reaching and communicating key brand messages to a targeted network of individuals, families, and communities interested in housing. Our content areas include feature stories and profiles on successful real estate agents, business owners, government, and community leaders. The Power Is Now magazines are the leading resource for real estate agents, mortgage bankers, entrepreneurs, and small home ownership businesses, providing leaders with business strategy information, resources, and tools through PIN, real estate, and programming guide magazines. Stay up to the minute with real estate and mortgage news and information from industry experts. VIP agents are able to feature listings each week. The Power Is Now TV radio podcast features weekly shows that include Homebuyers Town Hall, Real Estate Roundtable, VIP Agent Spotlight, and so much more. Each week, VIP agents have opportunities to be featured guests on the shows. VIP agents can discuss and showcase houses, neighborhoods, and provide brief introduction. The interviews are unlimited 10 to 15 minutes on each current listing. This product alone separates you from your competition. The Power Is Now delivers to you market update interview to promote listing weekly, promotional biographical video, co-host a bi-monthly homebuyers town hall show, featured subject matter expert on real estate roundtable show, the Power Is Now Program Guide e-magazine. The Power Is Now National e-magazine. Article writing and blogging. Social media content customization. Inclusion and press releases. Graphic design services. Business and performance coaching. Technology support. Referrals. Lead generation opportunities and management support.